What's up YouTube? Today I'm gonna go over a hand played last week at Life at the Bike and it will take us back to the pre-solver days when poker was about battling egos, there was no such thing as GTO, it was just a leveling game um, showing the other guys at the table who is boss. So uh, we'll jump right into the action here. The game we're playing is a 10-20 game and we see an under the gun limp with 10-7 suited which for me would be unorthodox, maybe for these guys it's uh, standard. You got all the action. Thank you. Don't even trip. Thank you. Matter of right. fact, I'm coming in your pot. We got a guy on the button named Big John. I like that. It shows like that he's a boss kind of or something like that. Uh, and he's gonna make the ISO with Queen Deuce off. Small Blind, on the other hand, also has Queen Deuce off, and he decides it's not worth seeing the flop. Uh, but we got another fella with a cool nickname in the Big Blind, Luda Chris. Again, a nickname I like. He 3 bets with Jack 8 suited. Check 8 suited is kind of seems on the loose side to me. Uh, obviously, Big John is also on the loose side with his Queen Deuce off. But I could guess that Ludacris's 3 bet isn't gonna generate a lot of full equity. And even though Big John is super wide, unless we have some good exploitative reads on him post flop, a hand like Check 8 suited might get us in trouble. Like, it's, it's fine ish. I'd like a hand that's a slightly bit better, like uh, King 8 suited, Queen 9 suited, Jack 8 suited is, is like right on the cutoff of maybe being a bit too loose, but yeah, it's live poker, you don't see that many hands, you think you're the best guy at the table, so I get that you're incentivized to play more hands, so maybe that's what's going on here. So the flop is a pretty good one for the pre-flop 3 better. It's a dry ace high board. The three better will have plenty of strong aces in his three betting range. Uh, he's gonna make a small continuation bet, which I like. I think it's good and standard and the best way to go here. He'll get plenty of folds usually and he can make bigger, more polarizing bets on later streets. So he can still build a pot, a big pot with his ace king or ace queen if he wants to. So the flop race is where it starts to get a bit more interesting. Well, pre-flop was already interesting, but I'm not gonna comment too much on that anymore. Besides that they made some plays I would not recommend. Uh, but the flop race is interesting as usually it's a board where the imposition color versus the tree bet wouldn't do a lot of raising in my opinion. It's like, yes, it's a high frequency C bet spot for the three better. He will C bet for high frequency for a small size, but he can get away with that because his range is so strong on this board. So I don't think it makes a lot of sense for imposition callers to the three bet to race here. So, but yeah, Nick decides to do it anyways with his flush draw. He might see the small c bet as weak and he will just try to make a small bluff raise with equity to pick up the pot instead of calling and maybe facing tough barrels on turn and river now this isn't just always a three i mean i, I remember seeing nick check raise ace queen against chris's ace king on an ace high board last week when i was in the game in a three bet pot 10 seconds so it's not like nick couldn't have ace queen occasionally sometimes an ace hand but here he's got a diamond draw so i like the commentary here um for trying to put nick on a raising range for the flop so i think obviously we can have he can have some semi bluffs like a flush draw maybe he can have a hand like five four suited something like that a gut shot Maybe he has some pocket pairs that he raises for protection. He just tries to pick it up with his mate hand, weaker than an ace. Or maybe he's creative, he's loose aggro, and he raises with some backdoor draws, like maybe um, 
I was gonna say jack 10 of spades, but uh, Ludacris has the jack 8 of spades, so uh, Chris won't have that. But we can come up with some similar hands like queen 10 of spades or some backdoor draw. Maybe king jack with the king of diamonds. I don't know what these guys are up to. So I'm analyzing this hand, but it's hard to do it from a GTO point of view as they're both making plays that aren't very GTO. It's like deep into the exploitative field or the, the leveling game of poker. Luda, Chris faces the flop race. So he's putting Nick on a range. And as the commentary, the commentator just said, maybe Nick has some hand like ace queen or ace jack that he's raising for value slash protection slash whatever. Uh, he just sees a small bet and he looks at his hand, he has a nice stop pair and maybe he thinks he wants to build a pot on the flop but then he realizes he's not gonna bet turn and river because then he would be value cutting himself, his hand is not strong enough to raise flop and bet turn and bet river. But he just sees a small bet, he looks at his hand, it's a pretty top pair so he decides to raise, something like that. And Chris is gonna three bet the flop with Jack eight. So Chris shows that he has a bigger pair than I do and he makes the flop three bet. So it's a very small three bet. And let's think for a second about what this play implies. So for starters, it implies of course that Chris thinks Nick is full of it and that Nick will find some faults so Chris might think that his flop 3-bet, even though he doesn't really have the hand to do it with, he might think that his hand just has enough immediate fall equity. We can also think that Chris might think that Nick still calls the flop with maybe a, a range that's a bit too wide, but he might fall to bets on later streets. So even though the flop 3-bet might not have enough direct fold equity, Maybe Chris thinks he can make Nick fold by the turn or the river. The problem, in my opinion, is that, well, yeah, Chris's hand isn't just very good to continue with. He does have a backdoor of Spatra, so that's nice. But if Nick maybe raises the flop with flush draws and had like ace jack or ace queen, then Chris isn't gonna win the hand on the turn because those hands will continue on most turns. So he has to maybe go all in by the river to wrap the ace king going for tin value and try to make Nick fall some aces. So for me, it's hard to really put Nick on an exact range. And I'm sure Chris has some better reads since they play together and maybe they have some live reads. So, for example, we see Nick take an interesting pose, like I googled the crossed arms pose. And, well, there's a variety of interpretations. So, like we see him sitting here, you think it's like the crossed arms, like bouncer style. I'm the boss, I got this under control. But it could also be like crossed arms is the self-hug. It's a comforting, trying to comfort yourself when you're insecure, when you're in a difficult position. So, I ain't no life reads expert so maybe you guys can chime in the comments tell me what you think about if we can deduct anything from this the flop three bet in my opinion is a play uh chris could make with a hand like ace king or ace queen so it's not like he never has any value here uh but yeah he wants some bluffs but I, clearly i think jack eight is going a bit overboard here the ace-3-3 paired board is, is a bit less scary than some other paired boards. Like if you're Chris and you're worried about villain holding trips, um, it's not going to hit a lot of trees. So if the pair is a bit higher, then Nick will hit more trips. But when it's a three, it's, it's pretty hard for Nick to uh, hit trips. Nick is not liking it. You see his breeding pattern changing a bit. But yeah, for me, that's a tough part about life reads or one of the tougher parts. We see he's uncomfortable and nervous, but is that because he has a super strong hand? Or like, for me, it doesn't really imply that he's weak. It's just that he's nervous, but you can be nervous with a good hand or with a hand that's not gonna fold or with a bluff. And Nick's gonna call. 
Whoa, the turn is an ace. So Nick makes a quick call and this turn is actually a fortunate one for Chris in this situation uh, when we look at both players' hands because now Nick has a harder time continuing with his flush draw so Chris can just make the small bet to try to make stuff fold. Oh, this is really, really something here because what hands would Chris 3-bet the flop with? Ace-3, a 3. Pocket aces, would any of those hands continue with a bet here on the turn? And Nick sitting there with, at a double-paired board with a flush draw. Yeah, so the thing is, um, the ace is fine for Nick bluffing with check 8, but if you think about a balanced point of view, if he has ace-x, he likely doesn't always barrel the turn on this turn, because um, he has, has the hand locked up and maybe he wants to get an extra bet out of Nick bluffing in some way. But yeah, clearly we're not too worried about balanced in this hand, in this spot, in this runout. Chris gonna bet 2,000 here. So Nick, this flush draw looks less pretty. Uh, he knows it's it's bad to call here. He might be trying that even if he hits his draw. Yeah. I mean, this is cool, but you know I don't like buying it for 20,000 and being a short stack either. You know what I mean? So you know that's why. you won't be the short stack. Or 10 or 15, and you'd be like super short. No, no, no. I'm just saying in general. That's why that. That's why that game wasn't as appealing. It was only appealing. Nick gonna put in the time extension. This hand is so interesting because. You know, I just had to come and let them know who I was. If Nick actually had an ace here, how would he play it? And would he need a time extension with an ace? Like, that's some next level Hollywooding. Hey, I told you, that shit worked. Most would just call and let Chris bluff off, because if you raised the flop with a hand like ace-queen, ace-jack, which we've actually seen Nick do against Chris. Like then it's less likely that Chris has an ace and you'd want to let him bluff off, so... Yes, I totally agree with the analysis here uh, of the commentator in this spot. And he is... Uh, looks like he was gonna raise... And he is gonna raise! I mean, everybody cares about... 2,000 to 5,300. Well, I mean, you know... So he's raising here, and I think this is the part of the hand that's most full of shit. Um, so he realizes his flush draw is might be tainted, even if he hits, he's not gonna win versus a, an ace. So he realizes um, he realizes calling isn't a very good option, but if he falls, he can't win the hand, and he he would like to win the hand, so he decides to put in the small race. Now, of course, as the commentator already said, like it doesn't really make sense for Ace X to do this. Um, would he call the time bank and then race with Ace X? Like, I don't really think so. Sean, no hard. Ten seconds. And Chris is gonna four bet the turn. Undo. Wow. Bet right there. Neither player with a pair bet, raise, re-raise, flop, call, bet, turn, raise, three bet. So Chris goes ahead and makes the click it back raise. He raises the bare minimum. Um, so with all these clicking battles, this is the one I like the most as this is the race that makes the least sense for Nick. Nick's turn race really doesn't rep anything at all. Of course, taking it a step further, Chris's re-race also doesn't make any sense at all. But I think it's hard for Nick to fight back. It really takes Phil Ivy to put in the jam with nothing and take down the pot. Uh, I can imagine both of these players have 
grown up watching those old school high stakes battles and were really inspired by what they see as true poker, like the the battling games, the leveling games, getting inside your opponent's head. Down to two players now, two players playing for the million dollars first place money. Ivy's still the leader with that queen eight suited. Three hearts out there for him. 80,000 is the bet. I've got queen high, but I'll take a stab at it. And look at this, re-raise by Jackson. Wow. So what the heck is he doing? So he's thinking it, and the question is, what? are we overthinking? A re-raise. Well, there you are. Re-raises to 320,000. It's right back in the face of Paul Jackson. Nice. Oh, my goodness. Jackson <laughs> is re-raising. Phil Ivey has got to fold here. I mean, is his opponent going to raise him twice with nothing? Everything Paul Jackson has done. All in. What? <laughs> That's why we're here and they're there. So this is, for some people, this is real poker. For other people, like myself, like I'm more of an online kid. Well, I'm not a kid anymore, but I'm more of an online guy. And I try to approach the game from a more GTO-based approach. So I'll never have a spot like this where I'm just click, 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 clicking it back with air, trying to guess which level my opponent is on, trying to not make him fall to my flop raise, but make him fall to my flop four bet or stuff like that. Like raising the flop to four bet to pick it up. That's just, that's just not my style. How much more to me? Now at this point, Nick asks, how much more to me? Like he still has a flush draw and he doesn't have to call a lot to win a big pot, but he knows he's drawing that versus ace x. So he makes the smart decision to finally fold the worst hand. It hurts to fold, I know. And Chris, Chris is too excited. He can't wait. It's like, uh, I don't want to show it, but I'm so proud of this amazing play I just made. So I just, I just have to show it. Look at this, guys. Yep, there it is. Oh. The fuck I'm talking about 200 for you. Just for that. You know what I'm saying? I know what you're saying. Anybody bluff Nick like that, I got 200 for him. You feel me? So they're implied out. Matter of fact, when you bluff them out of 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, I'm going to just start. Every thousand you bluff them out of, I'm going to just give you increments of 100. There it is. You know, Your hand was best. Ha, huh, jokes on you. You bluffed with the best hand, sucker. And I think we have another hand of the week. Thank you guys for watching. If you liked it, please hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button to stay up to date. Hit the notification to stay really up to date. And feel free to share this video with any of your friends that might enjoy it. This would really help me out a lot as a starting YouTube channel to gain some momentum. See you in the next one.